to talk to us about heparin and use from So good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming today. I'll be talking about heparin and use from cytopenia. Some people know as HIT, some people know as HIT type 2. Do you guys hear me well at the back? Okay. So the reason I chose this topic is for a few reasons. It's a very serious condition that carry a very high morbidity and mortality rate. Unfortunately, many of the physicians doesn't know how to diagnose or treat it. It's one of the major reasons for inpatient consult for hematologists. And almost every oncology patient is exposed to heparin at some point. If not for treatment, then for port flushes, IV line, catheters. So it's important for you to know if your patient is really diagnosed with HIT or it's misdiagnosed, what are the alternatives that you can use? Can you re-expose him later on to heparin or no? These are the uh, items I'll be covering today in my talk. So heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is an important adverse drug reaction that is caused by heparin-dependent IgG antibodies that cause platelet activation accompanied by formation of platelet-derived microparticles which are procoagulant and then increased thrombin generation. These are other definitions that we will come across uh, a lot during the presentation, so I want you to be aware of it. Isolated HET means HET without the thrombosis. Acute HET is thrombocytopenia, and the HET antibodies are positive. Subacute HET, the platelet has recovered, but still the antibodies are positive. So before we speak about uh, the pathophysiology, we need to know more about this molecule, the PF4, the platelet factor 4 uh, tetramer. So the platelet factor 4 is 70 amino acid protein. It's usually stored in the uh, alpha granules within the platelets. It's one of the subfamily of the chemokines, which is a signaling, path a signaling uh, protein family. Four molecules of the protein uh, factor 4, I would call it PF4, combined together forming this tetramide that you see its picture over here. And it's very rich in lysine and arginine, which makes this ring band or ring, uh, the positive band or positive ring around it. So under normal circumstances, it's just minimally secreted from the platelet in the plasma. Once you infuse heparin, the level increased by 20 to 30 folds. And as we all know, the heparin is a very negatively charged compound. So once this negatively charged compound is infused, there is 15 to 30 percent uh, to 30 fold increase in the level of the PF4. They get attached to each other, forming the PF4 heparin uh, complex. When the heparin attached to the PF4, it causes some conformational changes in what is in, on, on its surface, forming this green and uh, red dots that we see here. They are called them neoepitopes. They are basically antigen binding sites. This is the site where the hit antibody will get attached to. So there, uh, there are other molecules that combine to the, this PF4 and induce the same neoepitope like heparin. So it's important to know that because some of them are used in the antigen assays, as I can come to that later on. So now moving into the pathophysiology. As we see here, we have this uh, resting platelet. You have the uh, PF4 within the dense granules. Some of them are floating around in the plasma. And you also have on the surface of the platelet the FC receptors, one of the few receptors on the platelet surface. Once you're heparin infused, you have extra PF4 released, as I said. Then they attach to each other, forming the PF4 complex. This complex is immunogenic, will lead your B lymphocytes to produce antibody against it. Now, this PF4 heparin complex have a tendency to attach to the platelet surface. And in order for it to have the best attachment to the platelet surface, they have to be in certain relationship together. And the ratio should be either equimolar or two to one ratio. So once you have this optimal ratio, you have optimal attachment to the platelet surface. And obviously, if you have the, most of them attached to the platelet surface, they will be attacked more by the antibodies. And you have extra or more platelet activation. So the optimal platelet activation actually happen with the optimal binding of this uh, complex. So then this complex gets attached to the platelet surface, is being attacked by the antibody. As we know, the antibody has two portions, the FAB and the FC portion. The FAB will attach to this complex, forming the IgG heparin PF4 complex. And the FC portion of the immunoglobulin will get attached to the FC portion of the platelet. It will cause these receptors to cascade together, phosphorylate, and they start inducing signaling cascade in the platelet which will lead ultimately to platelet activation, aggregation, secretion of these microparticles. These microparticles, they are phospholipid that facilitate the coagulation reaction. They are very procoagulant and they induce the thrombin formation. Another thing happens in HET that this PF4 heparin complex also get attached to the surface of the monocyte. And when they are attacked by the antibodies, they uh, made the monocyte secrete tissue factor. And as we all know, the tissue factor will induce your uh, 
coagulation cascade as well. Your endothelium also have a protein attached to it called heparin sulfate. It's produced by the endothelial cell. It has some anticoagulation activity. It's kind of similar to the heparin. It's glucosaminoglycans as well. And its uh, main job is to maintain the integrity of the wall uh, by its minimally anticoagulant activity. So the PA4 by mistake get attached to this uh, heparin sulfate, and they are also attacked by the antibody, causing immune injury to the wall. So when you have this immune injury, again, the, the endothelial cell will secrete tissue factor. So all these three things, that tissue factor from the endothelial wall, from the monocyte, from the platelets, all this combined will lead to this marked thrombin formation uh, in this disease, which explains why this disease is very hypercoagulable. Can I ask, can I ask a question? Since we're, might as well ask a question. Sure. Um, even though thrombin is generated, tissue factor appears to be in this. It's very rare to see a fibrinogen decreased, and very rare to see a, quote, DIC fracture. Why do you suppose it's, that's, that's the case? In, in I will explain about the microparticles, why they are procoagulant, but actually DIC is like 5 to 15 percent in head, so it's not rare in head. About 5 percent? 5 to 15 percent. Why, why, why just 5 to 15 percent? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, the other thing about HIT, not everybody have the antibody or have even the activation of the platelet will develop clinical or severe HIT. It's very variable from one person to another according to your sensitivity your platelet sensitivity to the head antibodies. So this might play a role, I'm not sure. OK, so this uh, proving that the platelet secrete these microparticles and then the role in the procoagulant nature of the disease. So they tested uh, the platelet, they added uh, the head antibody, and then they put it with different concentrations of heparin. As you see, when there is no heparin, there is very minimal secretion of these microparticles. And we have, when you have the therapeutic range of heparin from 0.1 units to 0.3 units per ml, you have the maximal secretion of these microparticles. And once you have a very high dose of heparin, again, there is minimal secretion. Remember, I said that you have to have certain ratio between the heparin and the PF4 to have the maximal binding on the platelet surface, to have the maximal activation. So too high heparin or too less heparin will not induce head. And this uh, here proving that it's procoagulant by shortening the RVV time, the Russell Viper venom time. So we see here that in the microparticle rich uh, solution compared to the mi microparticle depleted solution, the head sera induced a short, I mean, more shortening of the RVVT time. It shortened the RVVT uh, by 23 seconds here to, compared to 11 seconds. So it seemed that it have role in uh, this hypercoagulable condition. Another proof. Uh, they tested the prothrombinase activity, which is a marker of the, of the thrombin formation. So you see here in the head sera patients, they have higher percentage of microparticles secreted, leading into higher thr prothrombinase activity units. So moving from the pathophysiology to the factors that influence the frequency of having head, uh, it seems like the type of heparin plays a major role. Bovine heparin more than the other kind of heparin. The low molecular weight heparin is the least one. And it seems that the size of the heparin molecule is the major factor in this. Also, surgical patients are more prone to develop head more than the medical. The least one are the obstetric patients. And obviously, the longer you are exposed to heparin, the more uh, instance you will get head. And therapeutic doses are more likely to induce head more than prophylactic doses. And this disease has some preference for female over males, but we don't really know why. So the absolute risk for head in low molecular weight heparin is very low, only 0.2%, but with unfractionated heparin, it's 2.6%. And if we break it down by patient population, we see that our cancer patient has around 1% uh, risk of getting hit on, on, on they are exposed to heparin. Also, it's important to know here that even with flushes, you still can get hit. So this also explains why some people are more prone than another, because even with this low uh, flushes, they still can get hit. So this is the iceberg model of HIT, and pretty much what it tells you that not everybody develop a HIT antibody will end up going having a clinical HIT, because the uh, FC receptor in the platelet, they have very low affinity to this HIT antibodies, and most of the HIT antibodies are being cleared by the lymphocytes. So before you develop it, most of them are really cleared. So not everybody having the antibody will end up having it. In fact, few of them will have the activation SA positive. Fewer will have the, th the clinical hit, which is thrombocytopenia. Fewer will go up getting the thrombosis. 
And as we see, uh, when you break down with the patient population, cardiac surgery patient, orthopedic or medical, it seems that there are more antibody formed in the cardiac patient, uh, more to other groups. But once you have antibody, orthopedic patient are more likely to develop it than the, card uh, than the cardiac uh, surgery patients. One of the explanations why almost 50% of patients undergoing cardiac surgery develop PET is because they are exposed to very high doses of heparin in surgery. They have to keep their PTT around 400 seconds, which is very high. And also the contact between the platelets and the bypa bypass machine lead to secretion of more PF4 out of the platelets. So head can come in different forms. It's not only in uh, one presentation. So the typical onset head that we all uh, know about, basically after five days of ex being exposed to heparin, on day six you start to have drop in your platelet. It can reach up to neither of 50 to 60,000 between day seven and day 14, and it starts to recover up slowly. The rapid onset head, when you are re-exposed to heparin, it starts dropping right away within 10 to 12 hours. It can reach a little bit lower neither between uh, 40 to 90,000, and then it starts to recover again. The late onset head is very, uh, interesting but not uh, fully understood phenomena and basically you develop the thrombocytopenia and the thrombosis completely after withdrawing all uh, kinds of heparin it's the range between 5 to 19 days after stopping your heparin you develop the thrombosis and the thrombocytopenia one of the theories because you have high titers of the uh, head antibody in your serum that they started to exhibit heparin independent act activation and the idea that the heparin one was exposed to the PF4, it already caused permanent change in its surface. So the new epitopes are still there, even though the heparin is not there anymore. So you have this high titer and you have the new epitopes, they get attached to it and induce the platelet uh, activation. It's very rare, not fully understood, but it have high incidence of thrombosis and DIC, probably because there is no more heparin that can oppose the thrombin generation in the system. Moving into the clinical features, Obviously, the thrombocytopenia is the central feature of the disease. 90% of patients, their platelet count will drop to less than 150,000. The mean platelet count will be around 55,000. 50% of the patient will develop thrombosis. And uh, venous thrombosis are, accounts for almost three quarters of the incidence. PE, have at least quarter of the incidence, very high incident. Skin lesions can vary from just erythematous plaques up to skin necrosis. And for some unknown reasons, one third of patients who develop the skin lesion, they don't have thrombocytopenia. Acute systemic reaction is not common, but it happens frequently, at least in quarter of patients who already have the antibodies in their system when they get heparin boluses. And it can range anywhere from just fever up to global uh, transit uh, amnesia. DIC, as I said, is, I mean, compared to other diseases, it's kind of uh, high incidence, five to 15%. And it's more common in the delayed onset, as I just mentioned. Continue with the clinical feature. This was a retrospective analysis of 400 patients. And what they saw that almost 85% of the patients will have more than 50% drop in their platelet counts. Half of the patient got uh, thromboembolic events. Third of the patient had at least two thromboembolic events, not only one. And fifth of the patient developed three thromboembolic events. Again, I'm stressing and showing how this disease is having high morbidity and very hypercoagulable condition. 5% developed either skin reaction or systemic reaction. And also, it seems that most of the thrombos thrombosis happen early in the disease. Most of them happen uh, at the day where the 50% drop happened or even before that. I mentioned that the venous thrombosis accounts for two-thirds of the condition, except in the uh, cardiac surgery patient. The predominance is for the arterial thrombosis. And here are the uh, thrombosis uh, incidence. So in the venous side, the most common one would be proximal DVTs, followed by PE. In the arterial side, the most common one would be limb artery thrombosis, followed by strokes. So this was one, one of the landmark studies. It was 14-year retrospective analysis of 62 patients having head, and they wanted to assess the occurrence of thrombosis after stopping heparin in isolated head. And it seems that at 30 days, it's 52%. So even though isolated head, I mean, you don't have the thrombosis on the diagnosis, and the heparin is stopped, but still, you have 30-day period where your risk is very high. So as I mentioned, in this iceberg model, we have a uh, very high incidence of patients that will have the antibodies in their system. Only a few of them will turn out to have the uh, clinical hit. So there has to be some way where we can 
have pretest probability that this really patient have hit or no. So they develop two major scoring systems, the 4T scoring system and the HEAP score, which is the hit expert probability score. The 4T score system is pretty much it's four categories, and they assess each of these four categories with the points from zero to two. So if you have more than 50% fall in your thrombocytopenia in your platelets, you will take two points in the thrombocytopenia category. And 30 to 50% will be, will be one point. Less than that, no points. And the timing also is of value. So if it's between five to 10, that's uh, obviously two points. And when you are re-exposed, it should be right away. Any other uh, uh, time period will, will have less points. And if you have new thrombosis or systemic reaction or skin reaction also, you're going to have two points. So if you have from zero to three points, that's low probability. From four to five, that's intermediate. And six to eight, that's high probability. So assessing the predictive value of this 40 score and is it really valuable or no, this was systematic review and meta-analysis for over 3,000 patients. And they assessed the 40 score in patients who are suspicious to have hit. And it seems that it has very good negative predictive value, almost 100% negative predictive value for the low probability score. However, the positive predictive value for high and intermediate is not that great. So you can pretty much, if you have low probability score on this test, assure that your patient does not have hit. The HEAP score was developed by 26 experts. They had their opinion, they uh, developed this score. They validated in 50 patients. It's pretty much the same four categories of the 40s, more uh, detailed question, more sophisticated scoring system, but it's kind of more or less uh, around the same uh, four things, the thrombocytopenia, the duration, the thrombosis, and if there's any other reasons for this. So they tried to prove that the score is better than the 40 score. So they assessed both scores in 50 patients, and they tried to pick up a point, cutoff point that optimizes both sensitivity and specificity, and they proved that their score have better negative predictive value than the 40 and better positive predictive value. However, this is another paper also in 48 patients addressed the same question, comparing the two scores in patients who uh, suspected to have hit, and they proved the other way around. They proved that the 40, uh, when they pick up a cutoff with that optimized sensitivity and specificity, the 40 has better negative predictive value uh, than the hip. So, I mean, most of the people with the 40 score, it's easy to remember, <laughs> easy to apply. I'm not aware that many people really use this hip complicated score system. Moving into the uh, diagnostic test for the hip, there is lots of uh, testing as we see, but they are breaking down into two main categories according to the endpoint they measure. So, one category measure the hip antibodies, Another category mentioned the uh, platelet activation. It's marker of the platelet activation. And out of all this platelet activation, the two widely uh, used are the serotonin release assay, which is considered the gold standard test for HET. It's the main test in North America. And the heparin-induced platelet activation and aggregation, or called HEPA, is the main uh, test used in Europe. And uh, in terms of the antigen assay, all of them are being used, but this is the commercially available one. And as you see, it's targeted against the other. Uh, if you remember, I said that there's another uh, compounds that can induce the new epitopes other than heparin. So it's tested not against the heparin uh, PA4 complex, it's against the PA4 polyvinyl sulfonate complex. And it had the same uh, sensitivity for head antibodies. This particle gel immune assay also is very uh, widely used now because it's very rapid. It takes only 15 minutes to get your results back. So testing the sensitivity and specificity, and specificity of this antigen assays, there have been multiple trials trying to assess that. So in this trial, uh, in 500 patients suspicious to have hit, they assessed the commercially available uh, test and the rapid one I, I mentioned, it's called DIAMED, which takes only 15 minutes, the particle gel immunoassay, uh, to see the sensitivity and specificity. And the considered patient to have hit if they have high or intermediate 40, and if they have the functional assay positive. And they proved here that this test have very high sensitivity, 100%, and 100% high, and negative predictive value, but not that great specificity. Same for the other uh, uh, test. These two other studies, they have different methodology, but they end up reaching the same conclusion, that our antigen assays have very high sensitivity and high negative predictive value, but not great specificity or positive predictive value. So it seems that both antigen assay can exclude the diagnosis of head, but neither is ideal as a standalone test to confirm your diagnosis. So if you have 
negative antigen assay and low probability, that's for sure your patient does not have it. However, if you have low probability in the 40 score and, it, and your patient tested positive, that does not mean that he has hit. You need to do further testing. But since the functional assay are very sophisticated, technically demanding, not available everywhere in the country, so they tried to see if there's any other way we can increase the specificity of these antigen assays. So they tried to see the threshold of the test, the, the unit where they measure the test called optical density. So they tried to see if having higher optical density will increase the specificity of your test or no. So in this study by done by Workington in 2008, he compared uh, the functional assay to the antigen assay. And it seems at 0.4, this is the cutoff for the test being positive or negative. It seems that the higher the optical density, the more likely your patient will have activation assay, the more likely your patient will have clinical head. So if you have optical density of two, almost 90% of your patient will have the positive activation assay, which is probably mean that most of them will develop head. The, again, these another two studies having different methodology, they all reach the same conclusion, that the higher optical density, the more likely your patient to have head. So it appears that combination of high optical density along with high clinical suspicion, meaning high 40 score, they will have the same accuracy for diagnosing HIT as the activation and assay. However, this strategy was never validated before any prospective trials, so we cannot rely on it 100%. Moving into the antigen, uh, the activational assays, we have, as I said, the two main ones, the serotonin release assay, the main test in the, uh, North America. It was developed in 1986 in Canada and the other one was developed in Germany in 1991. This is how both of them are being uh, done. So these are different steps to try to get washed platelet suspensions from your whole blood. After having this washed platelet suspension, you add uh, the serum which contains the antibody to it, and then you test it against three different heparin concentration, a very high heparin concentration, a therapeutic range of heparin concentrations, and heparin along with FC receptor antibody. We, we know that the FC receptor on the platelet are through which your head antibody will cause the platelet activations. So if you block that receptor, you're gonna block the platelet activation. So if your patient is having head, you should only induce uh, activation of the platelet only in the therapeutic concentration. So if you have positive uh, activation in the therapeutic range and in the very high heparin range, this means you have another immunoglobulins uh, or immune complex in your blood causing uh, this. It can be TTP, ITP, lupus, but it's not head. And if you develop this test, uh, positive activation with this heparin, with the antibody, this means that there is something else activating your platelet through another pathway, not your FC receptor, like thrombin. And after they do the test, which is, I mean, it's pretty sophisticated and they have to test it against these three different levels. They have to do it also against positive control, negative controls, and they have to achieve the same or the expected results to make sure that all these steps went right and there's nothing went wrong with these steps. So for the serotonin release, you add the radioactive serotonin over here. And then once your platelet is activated, you check your radioactive substance here. For the HEPA test, which is done in Europe, what they do, this solution should be uh, transparent. So once platelet activation happens, it starts to be turbid. So they pass light source through the solution, and according to how turbid the solution is, they deem the test positive. So proving that this uh, functional assay is specific for our disease, this was the paper that introduced this test in 1986, and they tested the, uh, the functional assay They tested the functional assay in 28 patients suspected to have head and over 500 control patients. At that time, 30 years ago, there were no uh, tests to confirm head. So they had this strict criteria to say you have definitely having head or probably or unlikely. And the test showed to be very specific. Only one out of the uh, 500 controls end up having the positive test. And all six patients who had uh, definitive head by the, by the criteria, they end up having positive test. And the four patients who does not have, who were unlikely to have the head, none of them have the positive test. So it showed that this activation assay is very specific and also highly sensitive. So the other test would also compare to uh, the serotonin release assay. They tested in 34 patients suspected to have head, and they proved it had very high concordance with the uh, SRA. So out of all 15 patients who were negative on the SRA, they are, were all negative on the HEPA. 
and out of the 14 patients who were positive for the SRA, 13 were positive in the HEPA. So it's also a very highly specific and sensitive uh, functional assay. So these two tests were done in 1980 and 1990. Moving to the 21st century, we have this novel test that being uh, developed right now, KKO inhibition ELISA, DT40 luciferase, and FC gamma uh, 2A proteolysis. So the KKO is monoclonal antibody against the PF4 heparin complex. So it's kind of similar antibody to the HIT. It competes with the HIT antibody to bind to the FC4 heparin uh, on the platelet surface. And the test, basically what they do, as you see here, if you have a sera which is negative for HIT antibody, most of the binding to the PF4 heparin complex will be done by the KKO. So you'll have high percentage, almost 100% of binding. But once you add the HIT antibody, it will compete with this KKO uh, and bind to the PF4 heparin. So you'll have less KKO binding. The other DT40 luciferase, it's a functional test. What they do, they, in, they transfected chicken B lymphocytes with the FC receptors, and it was, I don't know how good the idea of chicken B lymphocytes, but it was uh, transfected by this FC receptors. It was coupled to luciferase. So once your head antibody, attack the FC receptor, they will induce the signaling cascade to activate the platelet. So once they induce the signaling cascade, they will promote the luciferase, its activity will increase. Well, we can detect this activity and measure it. So this paper just published this month in, uh, in blood. They finally tested these two tests in vitro, and they compared it to the antigen assays in 58 patients. And they defined HIT as having high 40 score and positive functional assay. And they proved that the HIT positive plasma have greater mean inhibition to the KKO binding more than the HIT negative, 78% versus 26%. That was statistically significant. And they induced greater luciferase activity, three-fold uh, increase in the basal activity compared to 0.9-fold. And when they compared each test alone for its sensitivity and specificity, as we see here, the KKO inhibition at 66% is very sensitive and specific. The DT40 luciferase also have um, reasonable sensitivity and specificity. But when they combine both of them, you have very high specificity and sensitivity. So this looks like very promising combination for testing head that hopefully we'll implement in the near future. The other uh, diagnostic test is not published yet, still in press. And basically what they wanted to prove uh, that the proteolysis of this FC receptor can be marker for HET. So they tested HET sera and other sera from other uh, thrombotic uh, disorder like TTP, ITP, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, and to see w which of these disorders will cause FC receptor proteolysis. And it showed that none of these disorders were able to induce FC receptor proteolysis, only HET sera was able to induce FC receptor proteolysis. It's kind of specific to HET. And also sensitive because all the 20 patients who have HET, they had it, uh, they did proteolysis, and none of the HET negative were able to uh, cause uh, FC receptor proteolysis. So it's also kind of promising test, but it's not, uh, it's still not published yet. Uh, one extra benefit of this test, there were nine cases that were deemed indeterminate in the SRA. Indeterminate mean, as I uh, explained, that you have positive a test in the uh, therapeutic range of heparin and also in the very high range of heparin. So they said indeterminate because it seems that another anti antibody causing the activation, but they cannot exclude the presence of hit antibody as well. So in this indeterminate samples, this test were able to resolve five of them. He, he proved that three did not have hit and two did have hit. So, Bottom line, this is, should be your approach to diagnose HET. If you, somebody is uh, you should suspect having HET, do your 40 score. Low probability, don't bother, HET is excluded. Continue your heparin, look for some, some, something else. Intermediate, then check your antigen assay. If it is uh, negative or weakly positive, again, most likely your patient does not have HET. Continue your heparin, look for something else. However, if you're uh, having high 40 score or your, inter or your antigen assay came back strongly positive, then you have to have functional assay to prove you have hit or no. So once you have this intermediate or high uh, 40 score, you are obligated to start another anticoagulant until you get your test back. But 
what happened with most of our uh, hospital consult that before we get called they have low suspicion they call us and they put them right away on our get band which is in, uh, in incorrect moving to the management so you have to stop any kind of heparin including heparin line flushes heparin coated catheters platelet transfusion are not recommended even though these people have very uh, thrombocytopenia grade 3 or grade 4 they are not at risk for any bleeding they are at risk for thrombosis so there is no really need for platelet transfusion in them and the theoretically transfusion will induce even worse uh, hit but there have been multiple case reports that people got transfusion and nothing happened low molecular weight obviously also had risk to induce heparin even though it's 0.2 percent so it's, you, still you cannot use it you should not be using warfarin uh, at the beginning i will say why in a, in a second and you should always start other anticoagulants. So this a study done by Workington in 1997, and he examined all 158 patients in his, in his institution who developed HET. He found eight of them end up developing venous limb gangrene, and all eight of them were linked to the comedin. So he tested the serum for uh, protein C, and it seems before heparin, they all have very good protein C activity. Once they got heparin, you see the shift to the left, the protein C activity decreased. So he thought that uh, the uh, low protein C level initially will worsen your uh, prothrombotic uh, nature, the, the prothrombotic nature of the disease, and will let, end up having v this ugly venous limb gangrene. So ideally, you shouldn't start warfarin until the platelet counts start to come up again, which is kind of marker that uh, there is no more activation going on in, your, in the patient. So this is the American College of Chest Physicians ninth edition of their guidelines, just published a few months ago. Uh, and they said in patient with HIT, with thrombocytosis, with, with thrombosis, which is HITT, or isolated HIT, and they have normal kidney, you, have, you can use either argatroban, loferidine, or danaparoid over any other uh, medication, and they give that grade 2C recommendation. In patient with HIT and thrombosis and renal insufficiency, they suggest they're using argatroban, and in patient with acute head or subacute head who require cardiac surgery, they uh, suggested the biv bivaloridine. And they said that further studies needed to be done to assess the role of fondapenox and the new oral drugs like the, uh, like the bigatran or rivaroxaban in the treatment of head. Grade 2C is weak recommendation based on low quality evidence. So this is how uh, the other anticoagulant works. Uh, the denaparoid fundapenox are direct factor 10A inhibitors. The argatroban, leporidine are direct thrombin inhibitors. So as we see, none of them address uh, the head problem. None of them target the head antibody or the FPF4 heparin complex. They all work on the subsequent result of the head. They all work on the thrombin or the coagulation cascade. So this is a little comparison between uh, the five of them. The points I want uh, to point out here, as you see, the loperidine and the ergotropin, they have very short half-life. So this put your patient at risk for rebound hypercoagulability compared to denaparoid and pundapenox, which have very long half-life. Also, one other uh, troublesome problem with ergotropin and loperidine, the effect on INR. So once you start to bridge your patient with comedin, you're going to have this problem because the INR is I mean, it's being affected also by, by the ergotropin. So you don't really know, is it only your comedin that you're given or uh, it's also argatroban, and there are lots of, lots of problems when you stop argatroban, your NR drops. There's specific instruction how to give argatroban along with warfarin. Also, one more problem with the loperidine, this 40-60% of patients who will get it will, might develop antibody, and once they are re-exposed to loperidine some point else in their life, they might develop anaphylactic reaction. So it's pretty much one-time use drug. The 5% cross-reactivity with hit antibody, it's mainly in vivo, uh, very unlikely to happen in vitro, and it's not of any uh, concern clinically. And there are some case reports that fondaparox cause hit. I will come into that later on. We don't have to worry any much about danaparoid. It was withdrawn from the U.S. market in 2002, last year uh, also from Canada, and there are some prob prob problems in its supply in Europe. Same thing happened to leporidine, withdrawn last year from the U.S. market. <laughs> And this year also there are some problems with its availability in Canada and Europe. So we are pretty much left out with this argatroban, fondaprenox, and the new uh, oral drugs. Just a quick uh, word about lepridine, because I have been for years one of the main drugs. So the strongest evidence that we have for lepridine come from this HAT trials, HAT 1, 2, 3 trials. 
they were prospectively evaluating the loperidine against historical controls. And as we see here, the, there are subgroups in these trials. They are given different doses uh, of loperidine. Patients were divided into head with thrombosis, isolated head, uh, anticoagulation during cardiac surgery. And bottom line, they proved that with this uh, medication, you have very high decrease in your incidence of new thromboembolic event compared to the controls. The controls are patients having the same di diagnosis, head, but they receive any other anticoagulant. Obviously, your risk of bleeding will increase when you get loperidine. Argatroban also, again, it was compared in the same fashion, prospectively, but against hysterical controls. 9-11, 9-15 trials account for over 600 patients. It one of the strongest data for argatroban, and they end up reaching the same conclusion that either isolated head or head with thrombocytosis, with thrombosis, uh, the argatroban will give you uh, less incidence of new thrombosis, less incidence of death from the thrombosis compared to the controls. And in this trial, they proved that there's no difference in bleeding uh, risk between across all groups. Then I probably actually have the best uh, evidence out of all of them, and in the 2008 guidelines, it was grade 1B recommendation for, the, uh, for denaparoid, and 1C for argatroban and lopridine. I'm not sure why they changed them to 2C, because there was no data in the time that, uh, that came out that, I mean, say that they are not working well. So it, this is one of the few, if not the only, prospective randomized open-label trial comparing denaparoid to dextrain 70 in treating of 50, 42 patients with HET. And uh, the patient will confirm to have hit with the antigen assay and the 40 scoring system, obviously. The primary endpoint with the proportion of this thromboembolic events that will have complete clinical resolution by the time of this uh, of discharge from the hospital. And they proved here that 86 of the patient getting denaparoid will have either complete or partial resolution compared to only 50% of the uh, patient getting dextrain. One patient of denaparoid died from thrombosis compared to three on the dextrin group, and there were no major bleeding uh, in any of them. Fundaprinox, most of the data on Fundaprinox are case series. There's no really uh, randomized prospective uh, trials for Fundaprinox. All of them are pretty much case series. This is a case series of 16 patients. They all have very strong head, either uh, having uh, functional assay 90% or having very high optical density under antigen assay, median was two. At least 70% of this patient having thrombosis even before starting fundapenox. And as we see, uh, none of them after getting fundapenox develop any thrombosis, and only one have a bleeding event. Another case series for fundapenox in eight patients, uh, also all of them either have very high optical density on the antigen assay or very high um, uh, functional assay and none of them develop any complication with fundapenox, neither bleeding nor uh, thrombosis. This is a pooled analysis for five trials, five case series of fundapenox, and also it has the same conclusion. None of the patients develop any th th new thrombosis, only one uh, had bleeding. So even though it's not high quality data, but it's, it, it kind of tell you that fundapenox does work well in head. And in terms of the risk and the fear that you might develop, uh, hit with fundapenox, there have been only seven case reports published about this condition. And when you know that more than 11,000 patients have been treated with fundapenox in clinical trials, and only seven were reported to have hit, so it kind of tells you that this medication is, can be used. The, the fear of this complication should be very minimal. Moving to the new uh, or the novel drugs, the Debigatin and Rivaroxaban, this was. Uh, paper published last year in blood, and they proved in this uh, paper that both of these medications have no effect on the head antibody or the PA4 heparin complex interaction with the head antibody or with the plate activation. As we see here in this graph, they tested multiple anticoagulants, the, uh, the heparin and the two uh, novel drugs, on a different concentration. Uh, and this is the head uh, binding capacity, head antibody binding. So you see here heparin in its... Uh, therapeutic dose, it induced the maximal binding, and the higher heparin you get, the lower binding it will happen. However, for these two medications, the line is flat. I mean, they, they, they did not alter uh, the interaction or the binding of the hit antibody to the PF4 complexes. So they came up with their conclusion that it seemed that they can be appropriate as an anticoagulant in patients with history of HET. 
and theoretically they should work the same way like ergotropin and denaparoid so they should be working and the recommend that in countries where you don't have access to any other anticoagulant like ergotropin or denaparoid you can use them there is no clinical experience yet with this medication there is no prospective trials trial results yet that we have about them there is only one case report published uh, from Spain in Spanish journal that uh, said they have successfully treated one patient with adenaparoid, uh, with a dabigatran. So moving into novel drugs uh, for this uh, disease, we have these two drugs, the sick inhibitor and the odish. So we all know that the FC receptor is the main entry through, uh, through which the antibody will induce your uh, platelet activation. And the FC receptor, as I said, it initiates signaling cascade through which the platelet activation happens. So this signaling cascade is tyrosine kinase cascade. One of the tyrosine kinase is called spleen tyrosine kinase. So the idea, if you were able to inhibit this tyrosine kinase, you will halt the activation of the platelet, so you will stop all the consequences of it. So they developed this PRT318 uh, sick inhibitor. They tested in a mice model. And what they found that they, they got two groups of mice, one have vehicle and one have the uh, sick inhibitor. They found that the nadir platelet count getting the, uh, for the mice getting the sick inhibitor was significantly higher than those in the control mice. And when they examined uh, with new thrombosis visualization technique, they found that people having this uh, sick inhibitor did not develop thrombosis, actually. As you can see here, this is the lungs of the mice. Those who got vehicle, you see these bright green dots, they are thrombosis. And those who had uh, the sick inhibitor, none of them got, the lungs are clear, they didn't get any thrombosis. And also here, the serotonin release assay was negative. And the more uh, level of the sick inhibitor, the less platelet aggregation happens. The other medication, which is 2O3O desulfated heparin molecule, so it's heparin, but it's modified heparin molecule, and it's very interesting and very promising. It has multiple uh, effects. It seems that when, if you add it with heparin, it can prevent or alter the formation of the PF4 heparin complex. Oh, and if you add it to already formed PF4 heparin complex, it can alter this complex, or it can prevent uh, the, uh, the head antibody from being attached to them. And it's very minimally anticoagulant, so if you add it to heparin, it will not uh, increase your risk for bleeding. As we see here in this study, they tested the head antibody binding against the PF4 heparin complex. So you see here, when you had the PF4 heparin complex alone, you have very high binding to the head antibody. And the more you add from this compound, the less binding you get. So if you have less binding between the head antibody and the PF4 heparin complex, obviously you will not be able to induce the platelet activation. So this test, I mean, this drug can be used along with heparin in our patients. So the most important question, can I re-expose my patient to heparin at some point, or once he had head for, for, for the rest of his life, he cannot get heparin? So this antibody, usually all of them are undetected within a few weeks after uh, the episode of head has gone. And they can stay up to 90 to 100 days, not more than that. And it seems that head antibody are not re-stimulated when somebody with previous history of HIT is re-exposed to heparin. It does not take more than five days again to form your antibody, as if he was never exposed before to heparin. So we don't know really how heparin triggers the immunization, and the memory, the immunization memory of, he of heparin is not really understood. But apparently, once your HIT antibody are gone, you are almost, I mean, brand new patient, you can still be exposed to heparin again. Same thing will happen like anybody else. Real quick question on that. How about in that 90-day period, theoretically, is there a quicker response in that 90 period, you will have the rapid onset head. So it, this theory was tested in these 10 patients with history of acute head, and they needed all cardiac surgery. So they, during the acute episode, all had detected head antibody. At the time before they go to surgery, as we see here, they have, none of them have positive head antibody test. So the head antibody were not detected. They all got heparin, and none of them developed thrombocytopenia or thrombocytosis. And that and the body will never never occurred in them when they were tested over ten days period of time. Were Another patients getting pre just perioperative heparin or were they getting heparin over the course? They got heparin in the cardiac in the cardiac surgery, they seem like any other patients, and then they got the prophylaxis afterwards. They did. Yes. This is another uh, case series of patients 
seven patients have history of it in the past. They receive subsequent course of heparin after the loss of the antibodies. None of them, I mean, and variable, variable times, 10 year, years or months, or none of them develop thrombocytopenia, none of them develop thrombosis, and those who uh, were tested for the antigen and for the antibodies or the functional assay, they were both negative. So this also kind of reassure you that your patient can be exposed to heparin later on if he does not have heparin antibodies in his system. So finally, a little word about the financial impact of heparin. This was a paper published from the University of Utah a few years ago, and it seemed that the uh, cost for heparin head patient in-house for 85,000 compared to a patient who come to the hospital, same age group, same ICD-9 ICD code, it will only cost you 20,000. Another paper from uh, William Bowman Hospital in Michigan, they found that with each head patient, they have net loss of 15,000, and if you are a Medicare patient, they're going to have 20,000 loss for each patient. So if you are treating 50 of these in a year, you will ha end up having million dollar loss uh, uh, for head. So by this, I come to the end of my lecture. I would like to thank Dr. Hawkins and Dr. Varma for uh, reviewing my slides, and thank you for listening for me today.